My name is Karen O'Connor and I'm a consultant psychiatrist. I'm the national clinical lead for the Early Intervention in Psychosis programme. We're now going to hear from a young person as they describe what it was like to experience psychosis and the challenges they had accessing care. It was the start of the leaving start year. I started hearing voices, my name being called when there was no one there. It had happened before, maybe once every few months, but now it started happening a few times a week. A night in my room, I started to feel like I was being watched. I didn't feel like that all the time. It would just come and go. Well, leaving Sir is a stressful year, so I just thought it was because of that. I know people talk about stress and mental health more now, but you don't hear anyone talking about hearing voices or being watched. So I just wasn't going to be talking to anyone about that. I told people I was studying for the exams and I stopped playing sports. I stopped meeting my friends. I just felt like no one would get it. I couldn't tell anybody. My parents were worried at first, but I, I just told them I was stressed with the leaving cert, and they seemed to believe that. They arranged counselling in a youth counselling service, but then they were told the waiting list was four months. I saw my GP once, but I didn't want to tell them what was going on, so oh, I was just so embarrassed and afraid. I just wanted it all to go away. I got the appointment to see the counsellor in March. I went once. They said they could offer six sessions, but they thought I might need more support than that. I didn't bother going back. They wanted to talk about stress and my emotions. <sighs> How could I tell them the actual problem? That someone was watching me and trying to talk to me. No one asked about that or mentioned it in ads or brochures. I got through the leaving start okay. I didn't do as well as I'd hoped. I got my third choice, and I was just <laughs> relieved that it was over. And I really hoped that the move to college would make things better. Well, the first month of college actually went okay. I moved to Cork. Um, I lived with two other people I knew from home. It was nice being in a new place. I liked the course. Then. In November, I started to think that there were cameras in my house monitoring me. The voices got worse too. And I, I, I could hear people talking to me. They were saying I was in danger, that my family was in danger. I stopped going to lectures. I sat the Christmas exams, but there was so much going through my head that I, I just couldn't think. Well, then COVID struck. I went back home for lockdown. College was in line, so it was easier to stay in my room and avoid people. In May, I started thinking that people would be better off if I wasn't alive. The voices were there all the time. They were tormenting me. I threw away my phone, my laptop, because I thought they were recording me. I stayed up all night and I just slept through the day. One night, I took an overdose of tablets. I just wanted it all to stop. I don't think I wanted to die. I just, I just felt so afraid and so alone. My dad found me and called the ambulance. And they wanted to admit me to the psychiatric hospital, but I refused. I was detained under the Mental Health Act. I spent a month in the mental health hospital in the local town. I hated that they made me stay there, but, but things did get better. The voices went away after a few weeks and I felt safe. After I got discharged, I went to the outpatients department a few times, but every time I went, I met a different doctor. I'd have to retell the same story every time and it was just so pointless. They referred me to, the, to a psychologist, but told me I'd likely be waiting 12 months. I stopped going to the outpatients. I stopped the medication. Well, in August, the voices came back. I took another overdose. I was just admitted to the hospital again. But because I was back in Cork for college, I was admitted to a different hospital in Cork. 
This hospital has a specialist service for young people with psychosis. I now have my own dedicated key worker for the next three years. She calls out to see me at home. I see a psychiatrist, the same one, every couple of weeks. I've just started seeing a therapist who specialises in psychosis. As a family, we're seeing someone from the team to help us cope. Next week, we're meeting a lady who had psychosis herself and now works with this team to help other people. It all feels way more normal. <laughs> they totally get what's happening to me and it is helping. I know it's still early days, but I just feel better and my parents even seem to get it more. I can go to college and my parents don't ring me all the time to check if I'm okay. It feels like things are slowly getting back to normal. It is a relief. Psychosis is a condition that affects the way the brain processes information. The person experiencing psychosis might see, hear or believe things that are not real. Those suffering with psychosis can experience a loss of touch with reality and develop symptoms such as hallucinations or delusions. Psychosis typically has its onset in an individual's late teens or early 20s, as was the case for Jamie. This is a critical time of development in a young person's life, when they are becoming independent. They might be starting college, training or work. They might be developing their first intimate relationships and deep friendships. At this critical time, psychosis can knock people off their trajectory. And without the right help, people can find it hard to find their way back again. Despite there being an improved public awareness and comfort generally talking about mental health challenges, this has yet to extend to psychosis. It is very typical that when people start experiencing these symptoms, they can feel very fearful of sharing them with other people, for fear of being judged or treated differently. As was the case with Jamie, delays of 18 months to two years between people experiencing their first psychotic symptoms and accessing the specialist mental health care that they need is typical. The longer the delay between onset of symptoms and accessing care, the worse the outcome. As highlighted in Jamie's case, mental health care for psychosis in Ireland is still accessed late and in crisis. First contact is usually in an emergency department and an admission to a psychiatric hospital often follows. It doesn't have to be like this. We now have 20 years of data that says that early intervention in psychosis services can change this trajectory for people. They can ensure that anyone experiencing psychotic symptoms can easily access specialist assessment and treatment before they're in crisis. The specialist treatment available at these early intervention services includes talking therapy, family support, employment and education support, medication and physical health and lifestyle interventions. The health service has a fully approved national clinical program that if funded would ensure the national availability of early intervention services across Ireland. Early intervention in psychosis is an invest to save clinical programme. Each one euro invested in these, in these services results in an 18 euro saving to the economy by reducing admissions, by reducing relapses and supporting people to return to and stay in employment and education. Additional funding is required now to put these services into place in Ireland. Can we really afford not to invest in our young people?